In this video, I'll be showing you how to answer paper two map skills questions from the, from the June 2020 question paper 2-3 of the IGCSE Cambridge Geography exam. How you can use this video? Well, this video will show you how to complete this, these particular questions in the exam. It will offer you hints and tips on how to approach these questions. So my advice, with these, if you have the exam paper in front of you, follow complete at the same time, and then have a go at doing another past question. So just to recap, this particular part of the exam paper is worth 20 marks out of a possible 60. All of the questions are based on a map extract. It's compulsory. You should aim to spend about 30 minutes completing it. And although the questions tend to focus more on settlement and or mixture of rivers, they can bring in other aspects of the course, such as identifying features along, found along coastline or tourism services. But remember, you must have the following equipment for this exam. Protractor, ruler, and as well as your pen to write the answers with, pencils and a sharpener, as well as a rubber, just in case. Now just to recap this particular exam paper, four marks require you to use a key to identify a feature on the map and figure. Two marks require you to identify different heights. Four marks ask you to work out distances, bearings, direction, and a six figure reference. Three marks ask you to complete a cross section and label some features on it. A further three marks to describe the relief and drainage of an area. And the final four marks ask you to describe the site and reasons for growth of a settlement. Now, before starting the exam, I recommend that you draw this onto your map. A compass with the various bearings and the direction because it'd be very useful when answering a couple of questions. So make sure you obviously start off north and south, east and west, northwest, southeast, northeast, southwest. Now for the bearings in between, these are quite simple to work out. You always start off with the main direction, so north, south, east or west, and then you bolt on either northeast, depending where you need to go. So for the one in between north and northeast, it'd be north northeast. Between north and northwest, north northwest. At the bottom, again, between south and southeast, south southeast, and between south and southwest, south southwest. Now for the ones between northeast and east, for example, well, start off with east, then you're going southeast, so east southeast, or west southwest, east northeast, or west northwest. Quite hard to remember, but try and learn this off by heart because again, it's very useful and you'll see some of the questions that you do actually need to give quite a specific bearing. As well, double check what the scale and contour lines is and maybe make a note. So for example, for the scale, if it says one to 50,000, that means one centimeter on the map is 50,000 centimeters in real life or one centimeter is 500 meters. And if the scale is 1 to 25,000, that means one centimetre on the map is 250 metres in real life. It might be worth writing that down just before you start, so you have that point of reference. And again, another thing to identify is the, um, the contour line interval. In this, on this particular map, it's 10 metres, and it might be written directly underneath the map, like it is here. Or you might need to go into the key and find something like this. So on this map, the gap between each contour line is five meters. And that's again, very useful when you're having to draw the contours and the cross-sectional area onto your map. So you know, as you're going up or, or as you're going along the line and you're going between the big thick bars, you know exactly what the small ones are worth. Typically the first question will look something like this. So how to approach this question? First thing to remember is that the map extracts and the figure number have the same dimensions. In other words, the grid squares are exactly the same size, two centimeters by two centimeters. To focus your attention, draw the outline for figure 1.1 onto the map. And then find on the map the features from figure 1.1. So here you've got A, B, C, D, the height at E, and the contour line. Now for the first question, it asks you to find the feature A. So you need to find the correct feature and follow 
the line in this particular case to make sure they match. So here you have secondary roads. And there, as the answer says, secondary roads. Continuing on, feature B, what if we look closely, there's one of two possibilities. But I'm going to go with this one because the lines, the circles are covered in. Whereas on the other one, if I was going to select the first line, it'd be cable transport, but the circles aren't colored in. If I look at feature C, I need to find the blue circle, which is this one. Now remember, the feature in this particular case, the smaller blue circle aligns with the drinking water installation, the square, the building, and the circle, the water tower. That's why I'm going to select water tower. Feature D, again, we need to match up the correct symbol, and so it's the middle one, and therefore that means it's a castle. And then feature C, sorry, the height of triangulation pillar. It looks here for the triangulation pillar, and next to it's written 258. So I'm going to write 258 meters. If we look at the key, that's what it would tell me. And then this line here for F, well, if I follow that line around, it comes to about 200 meters, well, exactly 200 meters, because it's a contour line. And so those are my answers. Again, okay. if I check them against the mark scheme, yeah, there they are, all correct. Now remember for this, how the symbols are laid out corresponds exactly to the order in which they are defined in the key. So for example, back to feature C, we need to look at the last, the last one, that's what the symbol is, therefore the last in the order of what that means, water tower. Next question, what is the straight line distance from the church in the town mentioned to the church in Hoddy? Give your answers in meters, so straight line distance. Again, first thing you need to do is use the key to identify a church. Okay, so that is a little cross and it's an orange circle, so I find that in the first town which is here, and then in the second town, the end town, which is there. Okay, so I now need to measure the grid square. Yep, just to double check, two centimeters by two centimeters. And so I find the location in the center of both locations, put my ruler starting at naught at the church, and I measure across to the center in the other church, and it's about 4.7 centimeters. Now I check the key, and I look at the scale, in this particular case, the scale is one centimeter on the map is 50,000 centimeters per of life, which means one centimeter equals about 500 meters. And so 4.7 times 500 is 2,350 meters. Check the answers, and yeah, I'm within the 2,300 and 2,400 meter mark. So I get my one mark. Okay, now these two questions tend to be given together. So we need to find the compass direction from the church, from those same two churches, and the bearing as well. Now remember at the start, of, I told you to write down this bearings, this compass, draw on, sorry, this compass with the bearings onto your map. So that's when this becomes, for these particular questions, this is when it becomes useful. So I've already drawn onto the map my start point and my end point, and that's really important to know where the start and end point is. So where it says from the church, this location to the church and the other location. From is the start, to is the end. And that's again, really important when working out the bearing because at the start location, I'm gonna draw the little north arrow. And remember, north always faces the top, points to the top of the map. And there, on the start point, I'm gonna put my compass with north of the, sorry, of the um, protractor facing to the top. 90 degrees pointing to east, 180 pointing south. And so I'm going to line up and I've got my compass bearing here of about 112 degrees. So 112 degrees, if I look on my um, compass drawn, it's about east, south, east. Now I'm going to write out east, south, east and not put ESN because if you look at the mark scheme, it says just that southeast or east southeast to get the one mark and then my bearing has to be anywhere between 111 and 113. So remember it's important to know where your start end location is before and before you work out the bearing and always put that little north arrow at the start location so it's easier and you have a point of reference to put your north and where to put your protractor.
Another common question is to give the six figure grid reference of a particular location. In this case, we have the church. So let's define the feature. It should already be circled. And then for the six figure, we need to find the grid square it is in. The bottom left hand corner of the grid square it is in. I've marked that here with a little red circle. So to start off, we need to work out the four figure reference. So we go along the corridor to the number that's in line, that's 75. And then up the stairs to again the number that's in line, which is 96. And write that down. 75, leave a space. 96, leave a space. Because we need to work out the third and sixth number. To do that, we take our ruler and remember that the grid square is two centimeters across. And so that means for six figure references that two millimeters equals one point. So we take the ruler and we go across, draw a little line down to the number that's in line. And here is just over um, 0 0.5, which gives an answer to about three. Because remember, it's two millimeters equals one point. And then once we've worked that out, we need to go upstairs. So we go for the 96, the number after 96. Okay, we go up until we find the number that to draw a line to the number that's in line, and here we have um, 1.5. And so that is again two millimeters being one point, that comes down to about seven. And so again, here look 752, two or three, nine, six, seven to get the one mark. And that's how you do it using your ruler, being accurate, taking your time, and remember, work out. The length of each grid square first and then to get your calculation for the third and sixth point. These questions are perhaps the ones that take the longest time but the first thing to remember is that the figure dimensions are always the same as the map. So if I measure the line here or figure 1.2 you can see it's 10 centimeters and if I measure the same line and draw on that line onto the map again it is 10 centimeters. Now, for the first part of the question, I need to use label arrows to show the position of the N63 road and the railway. So if I've got my ruler, I measure across to the N63 road, I can see that it's about 1.9 centimetres. And likewise, the railway is about 2.6. Now, always double check against the key that you've got the right symbol to draw on. And so if I put my ruler up against on the figure, measure across to 1.9, I draw a couple of arrows, and to 2.6, and I label those the N63 and the railway, copying exactly how they answer, how they're written on the um, figure. Now, when it comes to drawing the cross section, I know I need to do these two little bits here. So I'm drawing my, got my ruler, and so I know I have to do it from about uh, 3.6 centimeters all the way to about 6.4 centimeters. So how do I do this? Well, the key is to remember that you. Um, have to look at what the contour lines are and to look at what does the key tell me about the contour line intervals. So here the elevation is about 10 meters that means that every contour line drawn is at a 10 meter gap and so when I'm looking them on I'm finding the whole the nearest whole number I'm being careful there are no circles so I'm following the contour line to make sure I've got the same height and I'm double checking to make sure where the land goes that it's going up to a higher height or down to a lower height. So once I've marked on my map where all the contour lines are, I'm then going to use my ruler to work out the distance from sort of zero, the start point of that purple line, and um, what those heights are. So for example, at 3.7 centimeters is 190 meters, 3.9, 200, 4 centimeters, 210, so on, so on, so on. And so I've drawn all the lines. Now, once I've drawn them on, I will then use my ruler and I'll plot, as you can see, those red dots onto my cross section, all of the various um, heights and their distance and the centimeters I've written down earlier, perhaps on the map or something like that. Once I've done those, I just connect the dots. Now, in the other part, some of these questions might also ask you to select several statements based on the relief or drainage of the area. Now, what do we mean by relief and what do we mean by drainage of the area? If you know what these two mean, terms are, please just skip ahead till we go through the answers to have a work out what the answers are. If not, stay watching. Relief is pretty much the height and shape of the lands. So how can we work out the height on the map? Quite simply, we use spot heights and triangulation pillars, or we use contour lines. 
So for example, here you can see the triangulation pillar shows a height of 260 meters, and the contour line is joining a line of equal height being 200 meters. Now the second part of the definition is the shape of the lands. And how can we work out the shape of the lands? Simply, we use contour lines. The closer the contour lines are together, the steeper the lands. And so we can use words like steep or gentle slopes, hilly, mountainous, or we can look at some of these features that you can see on there and we can label them on. Let's take a quick little moment to see what a valley looks like on the map, what's a saddle, a ridge, a cliff, so you are vaguely familiar when it comes to what you should be looking for. Second part asks us to focus on the drainage of the river. Now that really means several things that we can work out from the map i.e. the direction the river flows in, the density of surface drainage, pretty much the number of streams and rivers present, the more blue squiggly lines there are, the higher the river drainage, and the width of the river. Also, we can kind of work out the long profile of the river, by that I mean is it in the upper, middle, or lower course based on the features, steepness of slopes, width of the river, etc. So for example, if there's loads of steep slopes, we tend to be in the upper course, we might see more waterfalls, rapids, for example, and as we go towards the middle course, the river starts to meander, there starts to be a floodplain, or it's very flat as you get down to the lower course. As well, we can talk about the course of the river. Is it straight, meandering, or has there been some human interference, such as river straightening? So if we look at this map here, now we can tell the river is flowing in the southeast direction because to the top left of the map, the river is very thin, and as it goes, flows southeast, the river gets wider. Thin top of the mountain, wider as it goes further downstream. So we can say that the river is flowing in a southeast direction. Again, I've used my compass to help me with this. I know it's pretty much in the middle course of the river because the river starts to meander. It's very, um, it's quite wide. There's a bit of a floodplain either side. The slopes aren't as close to the river as perhaps they would be up in the upper course but there's quite a low drainage density as there aren't many streams or tributaries present. So if we go back to this question, what you need to do when it comes to this is work through what, um, each one at a time and double checking, are there actually any evidence for what they're saying? So is it an area of steep and gently sloping relief? Yeah, I would say so. Is it a mountain area, a mountainous area? No, because mountainous implies very tall heights. Is it flatlands? Can't be. Flatland means there's absence of contour lines, and there are contour lines here. The highest point is 250 meters. Well, if I look towards the south in grid square 7694, there's a contour line at 290, so that has to be false. The area is all gently steeping. No, not really. If I go and find the town of Odi, or Hodi, um, there's lots of very it's steeply sloping, but then if I go down to say, uh, towards grid square 7974 or 7594. Again, it's quite flat. There is a floodplain. I can see a very small stream, but apart from that, and again, so small stream, probably it's not gonna have much of a floodplain. And again, very steep mountains. The floodplain means it's nice and wide. Contour lines will be far apart, so that's false. The land is below 300 meters. Again, quick check. There's the contour line of 290, but I can't see any heights higher than that. So yes, there are a few rivers, certainly. There is a large river. Well, there's virtually no river present, so there's no large river. And then I would quickly check the land use using the key, and there is no swamp or marsh. And that's how you work it out. Double check the mark scheme, and there, all correct. Now, the final question might be is to describe the site and reasons for growth of a particular settlement. Now again, I'm just going to go through the various things that you can look out for. What do we mean by sites? Why a city would grow? Settlement would grow? What do we mean by situation? Type of settlement. So if you do know this, again, please skip ahead. So knowing type of settlement is really important in being able to work out some of the factors that affect the site and situation of the settlement, pretty much why a settlement has been built there. Dispersed settlements are the ones where the houses are spread apart over a very wide area, like an image I can see in the top and you're looking at the map below. Generally, they tend to be homes of farmers and they tend to be found in rural areas. And so in these areas, settlements tend to be in remote or mountainous regions. The land is predominantly used for agriculture and they're very much limited job opportunities, which pretty much explains why 
a settlement perhaps hasn't grown into a much larger one. Second type is linear settlements. These are ones that are built along lines. For example, geographical features such as a lake, a shore, a river, or a road. Um, where linear settlements follow a road, the road often came before the settlement, so they were built there to sort of um, use that as transport links. Other types of settlements, the final ones, nucleated settlements. These are where houses are grouped closely together, often around a central feature like a church, crossroads, or a particular industry. New settlements tend to have this pattern, and they tend to be found in areas that have flat relief, because it's easy to build on, maybe a bridging point, a very defensive position, a good water supply, and no restrictions to develop in any particular direction. So what do you mean by site? Pretty much the site is the land upon which a settlement is built. There could be lots of different reasons for this, such as a wet point, that there's a presence of water, or it's dry, it's high up, it won't flood. Particularly flat land makes it easier to build on, or it's a defensive site. Or maybe it's, it's protected by a hill. There might be fertile soil, might be trading aspects, resources, accessibility, it's easy to get access to other places, or as a bridging point across a river. It doesn't have to be all of these, but certainly some of them. And again, you will need to be able to look for evidence of these on your map. So how can you see these factors on the map? Well, wet points indicated by river streams or lakes. For example, here, you can look for that on the key. Dry point defensive site, well, look for contour lines. High on a hill pretty much implies that it's defensive or if it's a nice flat plateau. Fertile land natural resources, check on the key if there's a colour or look for the symbol such as farm. Natural resources, woods, mineral stones, mines or quarries, and you can find these symbols on the key or map. Training point accessibility, pretty much look for roads, rivers and railways. Bridging points, just look for the symbol. Whereas the site refers to initial reasons why people decided to build the settlement at a specific location. So for example, they wanted a defensive position close to a wet point with some trees. You can also think about the function of that town. It might give you an indication. If it's near the sea, it's probably a port. What's the reasons for that? Is there a quarry nearby? So it's probably a mining town. So the situation then refers to how easily the settlement can access other natural resources and attract peoples to its location. So the situation of a settlement will determine whether the city can grow, to, because the settlement can grow to become a large city, or if it will stay as a small town or village. So why did it originally locate there? Why could it grow? There's a the type of questions that you need to consider when looking at this question. So why did people choose this area? Well, to the confluence of a smaller river joining the main river, which is, could be a source of water. The nearby woodlands would have provided a source of fuel and building materials, so I've got reasons for sites. And why did it grow? Well, it may have grown because it's very accessible to other locations due to the railway passing through it, and it's near to the junction of two secondary roads. And so you can do that and answer all those points and we dodge out the mark scheme. Again, okay, on valley floor, yeah, you can see that with the contour lines, it's also next to a river, but it's very accessible. We developed it by mentioning about the railway and the two secondary roads. To mention that, that junction as well. A railway mentioned water from a river, fantastic, and woodland for fuel. Brilliant. Mentioned all of those four marks. And that is how you answer this particular exam question. Review, have a go at the exam question, and practice using another exam question to really cement those skills. Thank you for watching. Any comments, any feedback, greatly appreciated. Lovely for now.